what we do with our technical skills is solve human problems. And to solve the right human problems and to understand those problems well enough to solve them, you need those human skills. Let me hop on for a second because I think there's a, a strong sales pitch for this for people that might kind of roll their eyes or kind of say, here we go again, talking human skills. When you talk about investing in yourself, like what you're going to get better at, what you're going to improve. As engineers, we think about scalability, right? Like how something scales horizontal, vertically, et cetera. And our technical skills, they can't scale very far. In fact, if we pick the wrong technology, you can invest in skills that'll be dead in six months or maybe four years or whatever. You know, like my jQuery skills today don't really mean much anymore, even though I still have them. But the communication stuff specifically, as you improve and as you put effort into improving your communication, this is not just helping you in the world of your career and your business. This is your entire life. Like this scales horizontally across all your relationships, all of your interactions with other people. Like there's real scale to investing in these human skills and not necessarily instead of technical skills, but also... This episode is brought to you by our friends at Square. Develop on the platform that sellers trust. Support Square sellers by building apps for today's business needs. As a Square app partner, you can reach millions of business owners searching for trusted software solutions. As a Square solutions partner, you can get hired by sellers on the Square platform, find new clients, and build apps that meet their needs. Square loves developers. They work hard to enable you to launch fast with their developer tools. You get a full sandbox environment, an interactive API explorer, live event monitoring, backend SDKs for PHP, Ruby, Java, .NET, Python, and Node. You get secure payment SDKs for iOS, Android, React Native, and Flutter. You get it all. Learn more and get started at changelog.com slash square. Again, changelog.com slash square. This is JS Party, your weekly celebration of JavaScript and the web. Subscribe to the pod. If you haven't already, head to jsparty.fm for all the ways. And if you dig the show, please do tell a friend or a colleague. That'd be pretty cool. Special thanks to our partners at Fastly for shipping all of our pods super fast to wherever you listen. Check them out at fastly.com. And to our friends at fly.io. Host your app service close to your users. No ops required. Learn more at fly.io. Okay, hey, it's party time, y'all. Hello, friends. The sounds of those Breakmaster Cylinder beats means it's time once again for a JS party. I am Jared, your internet friend. I am joined today by K-Ball. What's up, man? Hey, hey. Excited to be here. Excited to have you. As always, we have a special guest with us, Tejas Kumar. What's up, man? Was good. It's good to be here. I'm here only for the vibes. You're here for the vibes. We have the vibes. So that's right. Glad you're here. We make the vibes. You are the vibes. And we do. We're going to continue to vibe. Let's start off with the React Brussels vibe. So last week we gave a holla to React Brussels. This week we have a speaker from React Brussels. Remember, that's the event happening in Brussels on October the 14th. And last week I gave you some of the details, but I forgot one big part. Okay, so the part that I forgot is that Omar from the organizing team gave us a couple of things to help bring people out to the event. So the first thing is, is a coupon code, JS Party Time, all caps. I don't know if the caps matter, but go ahead and, you know, QA test that form. See if you can go all caps or if they have a case insensitive matcher. And you save 30% off when you buy a ticket. We also have a free IRL ticket and five online tickets to give away. So we will be doing that. We don't have a plan yet. Follow us on Twitter, JS Party FM. So we'll let you know exactly how you can enter. It'll be pretty easy. And we will give out some tickets so we can get people out to the event. Hey, Josh, are you excited about this conference? I'm so excited. Dude, this conference is like, it's special. It's family style. It's very communal. So like, it's a tiny team and a small conference. It feels like it's just a bunch of friends hanging out, talking about React. It's the first time ever I think they do this, in person anyway. But they did a, re uh, it was like a JS Brussels conference. 
Brussels JS, I want to say. It's the same team okay. and it's it's just the best buy. Like and the thing that I like the most, right, is that they they want to really highlight Brussels for you. They want to give you a tour and they, hey, this is Belgium. Like let's go to cities and eat waffles and 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 it's very like proud of where it is. I like that. Yeah. I love those. Those like single track, one to 500 people like embedded in a space and like taking advantage of that space. I've been to a few that that did that and those are the best memories. Yep. That's my favorite. I like single track because it's like we're all having this one shared experience. Of course, it's fun to like put together your schedule and say, I'm going to this one and that one. And you can kind of like for these multi-track conferences, but like the small local like you said, communal single track events where like the organizers really care and they are really proud of their local region. So much fun. So interesting. And I'm getting super jealous that I'm not going to be there. What? But happy to help Omar and the team. No, I'm not going to be there. I'm a little jelly too. Man, don't you have like, aren't you tied with Omar? It'd be like, Omar, make it happen, bro. Okay. I haven't said that exact phrase, but if that works, <laughs> we'll see. I'm going to talk to Omar and see what happens. <laughs> they just says, make it happen, bro. Yeah, man. So what's your talk going to be about? I'm going to be talking about React. Wow. Unexpected. No, I'm going <laughs> to... Surprise. <laughs> so I was reading the React docs, right? And these new concurrent features are nice and really helpful. But since like Dan Abramov had this like JSConf Iceland talk where he like kind of teased suspense for data fetching, it's always been this thing that like, is it ready yet? And can I use it? You know, and with the new release, it is... But the React team's like, oh, but don't roll your own. You want to lean on a library, like React Query or something. Mm -hmm. And I am not saying people shouldn't do that. But I'm saying if somebody just wanted to play and see how the libraries work with this, that's what my talk's about. Is like, here's kind of what the libraries are doing. And if you wanted to build your own just to have fun, this is how it would look. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, we do that controversial thing where we throw promises and, you know, React caught some flack for that. Like, how could you throw promises? You're only supposed to throw errors. Mm -hmm. And JavaScript, meanwhile, is like, no, no, you can throw, literally, you can throw yourself if you try. Throw whatever you want, man. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. We'll be throwing some promises and looking at how it works in libraries. Those are cool talks because even if you're never going to use it directly and you're going to use React Query or something, like just having that knowledge of what's going on under the hood and I could reproduce this if I wanted to because I went to this awesome talk. That gives you so much confidence when you're using stuff and when you're debugging, why is it not working? Because now I understand what's going on yeah. down there in the nitty gritties. And it also gives you like topics for communication. I can totally see like hopefully people go to work the next day or after the conference and they're like, you won't believe what I learned. Here, let me show you. And they start pair programming and then and then community ensues. People end up more together. That's kind of the hope, the content I try to create. So. I'm one of those people a little skeptical about throwing promises and throwing throwing random stuff. Like that feels like what it should be a part of our WTFJS segment of like, really? Oh, okay. Really? We're doing that? Just because you can doesn't mean you should kind of a thing? Yeah. Well, and I don't know. So I'm kind of curious, like as someone who started digging in and using it, like how did it feel once you crossed that WTF boundary? I didn't even have the WTF boundary <laughs> because like, I don't know, man, I've been doing JavaScript for so long that I just expect all kinds of BS to be able to be done. <laughs> there you go. I've been writing JavaScript since I was like 12. I'm 29. That's more than half your life. You have internalized the WTF. Exactly. Because I'm not a purist. I've never come from like, I didn't even know what Turing complete meant until like two years ago. I'm like closer to JavaScript than proper programming, if that makes sense. So to me, I, I don't mm. see the problem with throwing promises. I'm curious, Cable, what makes you feel like WTF about throwing promises? Uh, there's a couple things. So one is just, it feels like it would make it very hard to track control flow and understand where things, like it, it's almost to like go to level of like, okay, hop myself way back out to who knows where, like the tracking control flow and like how does logic move through the system and how does that work just feels like it is going to be like full of foot guns and like very, very challenging to reason about and to debug. That's the main place that I'm coming from there is just like thinking about, okay, how would I understand what's going on in this code when I'm coming in and it's broken because either somebody else wrote it or I wrote it and it's six months ago or what have you. And like, I don't have the mental model for how it was supposed to work. Like, how am I going to track this down and figure it out? 
Um, so that's that's kind of like my initial reaction. Now, as I, said, I have not yet played around with this idea of throwing promises. So it may be that in practice, that is not as much of an issue, but certainly in considering it, it feels like, okay, this is going to maybe work when I follow the golden path and anytime anything breaks, it's going to be a nightmare to figure out what's going on. Yeah. That's because the error constructor gives you a stack trace, right? That's the whole point like of throwing even the like constructed errors. I see that. Yeah. Although like I understand your perspective absolutely. But from the React perspective as well, the reason they even do this is because the component tree can be super deep and they essentially want to recreate like suspense is basically error boundaries. Like you catch something that's data fetching some levels deep in your tree and don't render the DOM until it's ready. So like conceptually throwing a promise is kind of just like throwing to something above that's going to catch and be like, okay, spinner here. If the delay is too long. That's kind of why I think they even went for that construct. Because as far as I know in JavaScript, there's nothing that works quite like that, where you can throw from N levels deep and respond to it. Maybe event emitters probably work that way. But yeah, I can understand how. Now, what happens if the promise isn't caught? That's a good question. I think as of now, your global app suspends. So like the whole app doesn't render. So I think there's like a root level catch block, so to speak. Meaning until every suspense boundary fetches and is ready, nothing flushes to the screen. You just get a blank screen. And if you've already rendered something and you navigate somewhere else or have a subcomponent that's now re-rendering and throwing a promise that isn't caught, does it like blank out your screen? <laughs> I think it warns you in the console. I don't know what happens on the screen, but I think it warns you in the console, like, hey, just so you know, this thing suspended, but there was no fallback. Usually there's a fallback prop that you give to it, which is like a loading spinner or something. But in the absence of a fallback, that's actually good. I, sh I don't know how that responds. It'd be fun to try. I hear the problem that we're solving here. And it is a real problem. But I think it's also, once again, this is like you're, depending on how that's handled, which I don't have a sense, but it's essentially eliminating the possibility of containment for that component, right? That component cannot function necessarily in isolation. The parents have to understand yes. that it's going to throw something, right? And I need to handle that. Yes. Which that's okay for some patterns, right? And like that it does solve some otherwise relatively unsolved issues here. I just it feels fraught <laughs> to me. It feels like yeah, yeah. This is going to add a lot of maintenance overhead. And it's also going to add a lot of cognitive load, it sounds like. Because if you did want to run this component in isolation, you would then have to think, oh, wait, I should add a suspense boundary just at the boundary of this component itself. And that would then at least, while the component loads its data, you have the possibility to show something else. But you still have to like keep that in mind. If not, React will warn you. So yeah, I agree. What happens if you nest suspense boundaries? That's a good question. You can nest them. And I think... I don't know if this is out yet, but from what I saw in early demos, you can give them like different timeouts. So if like, if you have A at the top and then B is a nested suspense boundary, what would happen is your app would render until B and then pause rendering until B has data. And the highest up element from the thing that's suspending would pause until the thing that's suspending has data. Now, if there's multiple layers of suspense boundaries, right? But if there's just one at the very top of your app, then you have the choice of like not rendering anything or even like removing your app from the screen while something deeply nested is rendering, is fetching rather, is suspending. It does give you a containment problem. I hear that. It also gives you like fine grained control as to what to show and what to hide based on. You could, for example, if you have like a little to-do list, you could choose to hide your whole app while the list refreshes, or you could choose to just hide one to-do if you update that. You have more control. Yeah, I feel like this is potentially why the recommendation is there to say, like, use this within the context of libraries or things like that, because it creates this ability to foot gun. Yeah. You want to have someone who has spent the time to understand this. Guardrails. And go build a bunch of guardrails around it. Exactly. But yeah, I mean, to your point, it can be really valuable to know enough to go outside of that when you want to. Exactly. And even if not, it's just fun to hack together. Can I swear on this podcast? Is that is that allowed? You just did. Well, we'll believe you in the final one, but it's all good. I have occasionally uh, gotten a little salty as well. Sometimes K-Ball just does it just so I have to get the bleep out, you know, <laughs> which is just rude. 
Yeah. No, but like you've actually like through this discussion, I kind of have more content for my talk now at React Brussels because I could even just tell people, hey, listen, this is why use the library. But just in case, you know, <laughs> you, know you want to hack it together. Totally. We're hackers, right? Like that's fun. I was going to say hackers going to hack. Like that's what we do. So of course. Usually talks like this of mine are like the best received. Like I showed up to a meetup once and did not plan to do a talk there, right? But it was kind of dead. And the meetup organizer was like, dude, can you like do something? So I was like, I didn't prepare anything, but okay, sure. So I, I get up to present something and I'm like, what do I present? And then I'm like, you know what? Let's just re-implement React, like a cheap version of React, a cheap clone from scratch. How we did it was we wrote a React component, but we never imported React from React. So when you run this, you have a JavaScript error saying, you know, cannot read create element of undefined, right? And then we literally just like polyfilled this whole thing as we went. Yeah, going backwards from the API. Exactly. And, and we did that over 45 minutes. And by the end, we implemented React to render or hooks. And we kind of also inadvertently understood why the rules of hooks apply. Like, why can't you have conditional like use states and so on? It was fun. That was like my best, most well-received presentation ever. And it was a complete fluke. That's awesome. Did it get recorded? It is, yeah, it's on YouTube. It's called Deconstructing React. Okay, we'll link that one up. That sounds awesome. That's why as a, if you're a meetup organizer, you should always have a talk in your back pocket. Yeah. You are the ultimate backfill. Like, what if you hadn't <laughs> been there? Yeah, and, and I wasn't even planning. That's the cool thing. I think it was very spontaneous. And because I had really no material, I was like involving the people who were there. I'm like, hey, listen, why don't we all just like hack together and see what happens? And people got really invested as well, like on site. It was really a fun, fun time. And now, man, this YouTube video, like whenever I feel bad about myself, I just go on YouTube and look at the comments and people say the nicest <laughs> things. That's awesome. Which is so weird because like if you go on Twitter, like internet people, someone tweeted recently and said, no one can ever hate you as much as they do on the internet. <laughs> you know, like internet mm -hmm. people usually on Twitter, I find to be mean just because there's no like face or voice or humanity to connect to the person. Well, there's no repercussion right and you can hide behind the anonymity or the right. not the anonymity but the the lack of like pseudonymity yeah exactly but on youtube on, on this video like i think there's enough personality where people are actually nice so anyway i love making talks interactive in that way though i found that like if you plan on it right so you prepare enough content that is like going to be half of your talk and you're like i'm going to bring them in i'm going to be interactive like sometimes you end up with a dead audience and you're sunk Yep. Mm, then what do you do? And then you're like, dang it, I put all my eggs in this one basket, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Then you ask them not to record it and move on with your life. Yeah. <laughs> post it on YouTube. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Raygun. They give software teams instant visibility into the quality and the performance of their software. And I'm here with John Daniel Trask, co-founder and CEO of Raygun. JD, talk to me about the joy a team feels when they're able to find and resolve an issue, even before a customer has a chance to get upset or reach out to support about the issue. Talk to me about that. Well, I find it pretty exciting to be able to hit it off early. So and being able to tell people that you resolved something, so maybe they come through, you know, and they do report an issue and you can say, cool, well, we don't need to ask you for any more context. We've got all the details and we can have this fixed tomorrow. It turns an at-risk customer into an absolute raving advocate. So that's a huge win. And then the other thing that was a little bit embarrassing, we launched Raygun, but we had these other products and we instrumented them. And that's when we realized that less than 1% of our users would ever actually report a problem. And so you're sitting there thinking your software is actually not bad. And actually, <laughs> it's really, really bad. And that's hurting all of your conversion rates, business performance. You know, these aren't really dev tools. They're actually business tools. All right. If you want to see how this dev tool impacts the entire business, head to raygun.com to learn more and start your 14 day free trial. No credit card required. Join thousands of customer centric software teams who use Raygun every single day to deliver flawless experiences to their customers. Again, raygun.com. So 
So we wanted to talk about this thing you wrote recently on your website, the pillars of impact for web engineers. Interesting, it started off as it was gonna be a text message and then I guess you realized you had a lot to say about it. So you turned it into a, a nice big long blog post and then you, I assume you just texted the link to the blog post. That's very much a Scott Hanselman move. Oh really, I didn't know that. Yeah, he will not email anybody answers speaking very generally i'm sure he does it sometimes but his stance is like you only have so many keystrokes in your life and so if you're going to write something write it in a place that's public of course assuming that you're giving public advice and then take that link and give it to the person and now you've shared it with much more it's about impact right you have a much bigger impact with your words versus writing a personal email that only one person will ever write so or ever read. So anyways, that's his stance. It seems like in this case, you followed that exact same thing. And here we are. Now a lot more people are benefiting from your thoughts. So why don't you uh, unpack this for us, these different pillars you come up with of yeah. different ways you can have impact as an engineer. Yeah, sure. Like my one of my best friends, a former coworker at Spotify, Iris, asked me about this. I don't remember why, but it was at the time where I was thinking about about the industry at large anyway and like i'm really tired of like working with really smart people preach sometimes there's people who are like i'm so smart and who like you know there's an energy there's a tech bro energy that is not conducive to good vibes it's very much a if i ask you a question i already know you're just gonna paste me a google result link to some abstract results that, that I could do myself, but you just want right. to show me how busy you are or whatever. And like, I think we have missed the mark on what we consider smart historically, where we think smart is somebody who can write like a one line map reduce. Whereas I think we've kind of missed prioritizing like emotional intelligence as highly as we ought personally. Mm -hmm. That's kind of some of the thinking that went in here because in these pillars of impact, as I've written, there's four of them because you, you know, like legs on a table, four pillars usually lead to something standing. The only one of them, the last one is technical impact because we're in a day and age, y'all, where I think pretty much anyone who has the resources and means can learn how to code. Like Free Code Camp, Quincy Larson, like that stuff. I think there's like 3,000 hours of courses where you could just like learn stuff. and get So... Writing code and being able to Google and Stack Overflow internals of React or Elasticsearch or whatever it may be, I don't believe this is as valuable, for example, as recognizing when your teammate is either burnt out and then covering for them or like recognizing when somebody really cares about documentation and if you're in a position to do so, saying, hey, why don't you lead that? I would love to follow you here and, and kind of, you know, let them take the lead and, and, and pioneer some stuff. Those things... We even call them soft skills. And I have a problem with this because I feel like make, calling them... Oh, you're talking k language. I feel like calling them soft minimizes them, right? But really, these interpersonal relationship things, like k you were talking about connection earlier, like those, in my opinion, matter way more than the technical BS that we do because anyone could do that these days. So that's kind of what led into this blog post. I'm on a campaign to call get them called human skills. Exactly. Rather than soft skills. That's good. Yeah, why don't you tell me more? He's uh, Jared said I was speaking your language. I'm curious. Start a petition. I love this. One thing that immediately springs to mind and something that I, I try to communicate to as many engineers as possible is your technical skills are important and maybe a distinguisher of success early in your career. But overwhelmingly, what I see that separates folks who kind of go a ways and get stuck from those who are successful later in their career is those human skills. It's communication, it's tech, it's empathy, it's leadership, it's coaching, it's all of these different pieces that go into how do I take this base of technical skills that I built up and actually apply it in a way that makes my coworkers better, my company better, my product better, like really understanding all of the things that go around it. Because at the end of the day, what we do with our technical skills is solve human problems and to solve the right human problems and to understand those problems well enough to solve them. You need those human skills. Yeah. Let me hop on for a second, because I think there's a, a strong sales pitch for this, for people that might kind of roll their eyes or kind of say, here we go again, talking human skills. When you talk about investing in yourself, like what you're going to get better at, what you're going to improve as engineers, we think about scalability, right? Like how something scales horizontal, vertically, et cetera. And our technical skills, 
they can't scale very far. In fact, if we pick the wrong technology, you can invest in skills that'll be dead in six months or maybe four years or whatever. You know, like my jQuery skills today don't really mean much anymore, even though I still have them. Like, is nobody hiring jQuery today? I would love to. But the communication stuff specifically, and a lot of these things, but specifically think about communication, as you improve and as you put effort into improving your communication, this is not just helping you in the world of your career and your business. This is your entire life. Like this scales horizontally across all your relationships, all of your interactions with other people. Like there's real scale to investing in these human skills and not necessarily instead of technical skills, but also, you know, in addition to your technical skills, and they are, as I mean, I agree with you, K-Ball, they are the things that level you up beyond the landing that job and staying in the industry as an employed person, like getting to that next phase. It's almost always human stuff. Yeah, it's interesting because like, I'm a great example of this. I honestly, when I started my career, I was not very competent technically. Some would say today I'm not very competent technically. You know what I'm saying? But like, I mean, I throw promises for goodness sake. You know what I'm saying? But You throw promises, man. Come on. But you did re-implement React so in 45 minutes. <laughs> it was a cheap clone. But yeah, I hear what you're saying. Thank you, by the way. No, but <laughs> the only reason I've seen the success that I've seen, which I consider to be a significant amount given my background, is because I tend to be good interpersonally with people. I've put in the work to create a likable, amicable, friendly personality. And this, I believe, pays dividends. It's not like... Conversely, I've seen a lot of people, especially in this industry where supply and demand are so heavily in favor of me, of the individual, mm -hmm. people don't last long in jobs. Like, I especially think about my, my friend Nader Dabit, who like, he'll finish like a year somewhere and then go get a new job. And this is not like an exception. This is common. In this industry, I don't know people who stay at jobs for... No, that's common. Yeah. I don't know people who stay at jobs for more than two years because we have the options, right? Every time I hear someone leave a job, it's almost never about, oh, the code was too hard. It was usually, ah, the people didn't believe in me or something like this. It's usually an interpersonal thing. I also read a study where they kind of found that after earning a certain amount of money, I think it was like something of the order of $70,000 a year or something, people tend to think less of every extra dollar. And then suddenly these interpersonal things, these human skills as they're calling them, become way more of a factor in choosing where you work and why you work there. Right. I think this is invaluable. And this is kind of this blog post is an attempt at highlighting these things. And also speaking to some of the realities in the industry, man, like I've had coworkers tell me they think I write shit code because I'm Indian. What? Yeah. And, and, you know, I've had them even justify it, argue to my face, telling me, well, you know, it's just law of averages. There's so many call centers and consultants <laughs> who don't have the time to be trained. Wow. Yeah, exactly. And so... The blog post is kind of talking about now, whether we recognize it or not, statements like that and conversations like that also have impact. Yeah. They're just not very good impact, <laughs> you know? Right. The wrong kind. Right. Exactly. So this post kind of talks about the wrong kind of impact and the healthy kind of impact, ultimately trying to help us move towards like, you know, as K-Ball was saying, connection and community with other human beings is really the... Sorry, I know you're going to bleep that, but like it's, I don't know how else to say it. You're making me work, man. You're making me work. I mean, at this point, that's where how I decide where to work, right? Like I don't choose, there's these different things you can decide. What do you want to work on, right? Is this a great company? Is that, are they going to the moon? Your salaries, is this cool projects, whatever. Like my number one thing I look for is do I want to work with these people? Exactly. Everything else is secondary or third or what have you. Like the number one question is, do I want to work with these people? And conversely, like I'm closing in on three years at my current company. And especially before the job market started going south, like you're hearing all these people, they're shifting around and you get this like, am I missing out? What's going on? And I was like, oh, I should, right. I should talk to different people. I talked to some folks and I'm like, no, I want to keep working with these people. They're amazing. Like I don't, all that other stuff is shiny and exciting, but like the people are the reason that it's fun to show up somewhere. Yeah. Exactly. And th this goes so much deeper even, right? Because like I I recently read a book, I'll talk about it in the shout out section if we get to it, but essentially the author highlights 
how what made us the apex predator and the top of the food chain and like, you know, human beings superior above animals and all this. It's not that we were the smartest necessarily, but that we were the most collaborative. Human connection by and large is the whole deal, man. And so like when we work together in a team where we feel at home, amazing things happen. So yeah, I think mm. the interpersonal vibe, you could just summarize and call it a vibe, right? But like the interpersonal energy is is so key. And honestly, like where I work today, look, there's sometimes there's drama and there's communication issues with, with people and so on. But like my immediate team, the DevRel team, these people, dude, I'd be comfortable going to war with like with them on my side, so to speak. They have my back. I know it. And even if there's times where I'm looking around, I'm like, ooh, my friend Hussein's at, at Google wants to hire me there. And like, you know, if the job market looks attractive, I'm like, but these people here, mm. these are my people, man. Says a lot for retention. I'd love if we could then dig into some kind of actionable things for folks, right? Like a lot of this comes from the top, comes from team culture, comes from manager culture, things like that. But if you're on a team, you're an individual, how do you go about improving the vibe? So, yeah, this is a great, you won't believe how many conversations I have weekly with people at my work about this. For one thing, recently I read this book, I'm telling you, I'll shout it out at the end. Whew. What I do to bring the vibe is number one, and I don't have a formula and this is, you know, this is conjecture, right? But number one, I realized that I cannot read minds. Like human beings, 10 out of 10 times have no idea what the other person is thinking. It's just impossible. So sometimes I'll get a pull request review full of nitpicks. Hey, can you use the word directory instead of folder in this readme? And I'm like, really, bro? You want to go there? But I don't know if this is malicious or not. It's probably not. I have no way of knowing. So I keep that at the forefront of my mind when I see things. Just like, hey, I don't know what this person is. I could even ask them. And that removes some of this initial kind of vitriol that is instinctive within us when we receive things we perceive as hostile. So that's one thing I do. The other thing I do is I tend to value connection with humans. Uh, so again, I've read lots of research like from MIT and Harvard and Yale. And it turns out no man is an island is an extremely true maxim. <laughs> we were not made to be alone. And so what I'll do is I'll try to pursue like, hey, let's just hang out and have like a water cooler Zoom chat, things like this. But above and beyond that, I recognize the flip side of this. And I think this is probably the most important thing I'll say. And I'll stop after this because I think it's, that's enough, is recognizing loneliness as this like silent killer murderous disease that just kind of creeps up on us. And I don't know what kind of society y'all were raised in. I was raised with this like weird, like pseudo Indian Middle Eastern vibe. That's where I grew up. And in India, you don't talk about that stuff. It's like, oh, no, no, you can't admit you're lonely. That's weak. You're weak. What are you, weak? Are you a girl or something? This is what we grew up with. It's toxic. It's not really healthy, right? And when we don't acknowledge, hey, I'm feeling super lonely and I need some connection, then we start playing with fire. Because in the literature, and this is consistent research across multiple bodies and years and researchers that show that when people feel lonely, two things happen. One, you trust other people less. And two, you just automatically assume ill intent. If you're really suffering from loneliness and somebody brings you a cake, you're going to be like, wait, is this poison? Why, why? what's your agenda here? And conversely, if you're in community, mm -hmm. the same events will elicit a different response. You'll be trusting and you'll, you know, if somebody comes and like punches you, but you're, you have, you're full of community, you'll be like, wait, you didn't mean that, right? Like you'd assume good intent, like organically. And I've in the past had managers who tell me like, oh, just assume good intent. But telling someone to do that isn't enough. And from what I've seen, like being in community makes assuming good intent more accessible. So that's kind of what I do is now. I have destigmatized in myself uh, loneliness. I started to like recognize, hey, I feel super lonely right now. Thankfully, I have a wife. So like I go to her and I'm like, listen, I'm super lonely right now. Could you spend like five minutes with me so I get back to reality? And she does this and then I come back and read a pull request that once seemed hostile. And now I'm like, oh man, this is fine. Either this is fine or I have even like empathy for the person. I'm like, oh, they must be having a hard day or something. So that, yeah, that's kind of what I'm doing to bring the vibe. And it seems to be working. I love some of the things you're talking about there, and I want to combine two of them. A practice I've been doing for a while and encouraging my reports now that I'm a manager to do, which is if you get a PR review or a ticket or something from someone that you don't have already a personal connection to, set up a 30-minute one-on-one that is purely about creating a social connection. And 
doing that has like just helped tremendously so much in like getting the, the level of malicious intent feeling of like, why are they doing this? Why are they asking this mean thing? Whatever. And it's even bigger cross engineering, right? Like set that up with the customer success rep who keeps filing tickets that you have to solve because the more they understand that you are a human being and you understand that they are a human being like implicitly, like we know that in our heads, but you feel that because you know, Hey, Brian's not following filing this ticket to make me mad. He's filing this cause he's got this thing and I know he's cool and we vibe over music and whatever. Like it just makes such a world of difference in all these, this world of interaction that's so text-based to make that social connection. Once you start having any of that coming through. All good. The blog post, Pillars of Impact for Web Engineers, it's in your show notes. Obviously, we're not going to cover it word for word. So if you like what Tejas is saying and you like to hear more, go give that one a read. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Fly. Fly lets you deploy full stack apps and databases close to your users, and they make it too easy. No ops are required. And I'm here with Chris McCord, the creator of Phoenix Framework for Elixir and staff engineer at Fly. Chris, I know you've been working hard for many years to remove the complexity of running full stack apps in production. So now that you're at Fly solving these problems at scale, what's the challenge you're facing? One of the challenges we've had at Fly is getting people to really understand the benefits of running close to a user, because I think as developers, we internalize as a CDN, people get it. They're like, oh yeah, you want to put your JavaScript close to a user and your CSS. But then for some reason, we have this mental block when it comes to our applications. And I don't know why that is. And getting people past that block is really important because a lot of us are privileged that we, we live in North America and we deploy 50 millisecond hop away. So things feel fast. Like when GitHub, maybe they're deploying regionally now, but for the first 12 years of their existence, GitHub worked great if you lived in North America. If you lived in Europe or anywhere else in the world, you had to hop over the ocean and it was actually a pretty slow experience. So one of the things with Fly is it runs your app code close to users. So it's the same mental model of like, hey, it's really important to put our images and our CSS close to users. But like, what if your app could run there as well? API requests could be super fast. What if your data was replicated there? Database requests could be super fast. So I think the challenge for Fly is to get people to understand that the CDN model maps exactly to your application code. And it's even more important for your app to be running close to a user because it's not just requesting a file. It's like your data and saving data to disk, fetching data for disk, that all needs to live close to the user for the same reason that your JavaScript assets should be close to a user. Very cool, thank you, Chris. So if you understand why you CDN, your CSS, and your JavaScript, then you understand why you should do the same for your full stack app code. And Fly makes it too easy to launch most apps in about three minutes. Try it free today at fly.io. Again, fly.io. And by our friends at Hasora. Hasora lets you create dynamic, high performance GraphQL and REST APIs from your databases in minutes with granular authorization and caching baked in. All this without touching your underlying database. Go from data to API in literally minutes. As the technology landscape evolves, a key bottleneck for teams is making data accessible, especially in enterprise environments. Modernizing applications and building new features is critically dependent on being able to shape, control, and ship your data to interfaces demanding always available real-time access. Asura solves this problem by connecting your databases, your REST servers, your GraphQL servers, and third-party APIs to provide a unified, real-time GraphQL API across all your data sources. Imagine your tech stack is a Postgres database, Go is your backend language, REST APIs, and vendors who only expose REST and React for your front end. Hasora can give you an instant GraphQL API for your front end, an API that's protected with roles, caching, and everything you expect from a secure API, and the ability to connect all your services into a single API. All this while ensuring the performance, the security, and the reliability requirements of your API layer. The most important business value Hasora provides is reducing time to market. Imagine if your team can go from data to API in literally minutes, it would be a game changer. Everything they do is through the lens of making developers productive and getting to production ready in minutes. The easiest way to get started with Hasora is with Hasora Cloud. It is fully managed and scales as you grow. Head to hasora.io slash jsparty. That's H-A-S-U-R-A dot I-O slash jsparty. Again, hasora.io slash jsparty. All right. 
guess what time it is? It's time for Story of the Week. It's time to take a peek. It's time for the Story of the Week. Wow, man. Jared, that's an amazing singing voice you have. I am an excellent musician, except for that's not me, so I can't take <laughs> credit. But I, I did commission it, so I guess I can take some credit. That's our good friend, Matt Ryer. It was on the fly, right? He did that on the fly when you asked him? Yeah, he just did it just now. He did, just now. Yeah, he actually, I just keep him in the corner over here <laughs> with his guitar. And I just throw change at him, like, you know, sing, monkey, sing. No, <laughs> it's our good friend, Matt Ryer from Go Time, and he's uh, quite the musician. So this is Story of the Week. This is where we take turns sharing what we believe are the most important or biggest stories of the week. And then we debate who's actually got the best story. No, we don't really care about that. That's just the premise. We just share stories and talk about them. So I will kick us off with what is, I guess, not something that's happened, but something that's talked about going to happen, which is that Dino has announced on their blog some big changes ahead. So this is future stuff for Dino. Interesting, anytime that you see a company announcing things that are going to happen, you think, are they reacting to something that's been going on? It seems like they feel like they have to say something. And I think they are reacting to some of the excitement and the buzz around Bun, the new JS runtime, which is blazing fast and is very much a competitor to Dino and Node.js, the up and comer, which got a bunch of people's ears perking up in the recent weeks because of the speed. So Dino has a couple of announcements, two big ones here that I'll focus in on. They actually announce a few more things that are going to happen. The first one is that they've been working on some updates that will allow Dino to easily import NPM packages, which will make the vast majority of NPM packages work in Dino within the next three months. So as I often say, no self-respecting software developer gives an ETA when they don't have to, but they've locked themselves into a 90-day cycle on this feature. They must be pretty close to having it finished. Maybe they listened to JS Party back when Dino was initially announced and we were ragging on them for not having package support. <laughs> and we were like, you got it, support NPM. Yeah, totally. Although I think uh, strategically, this is somewhat of an obvious need. Now, I guess the technical requirements to get them there were probably not straightforward. So that's why it's taken a while. But I think anytime you start something brand new, you want to have an ecosystem that exists and you're ignoring the largest package ecosystem in the world, not the wisest move. So they're working on that. And the second one is their goal is to make Dino the fastest JS runtime. This is why I said, I think they're reacting very much to a lot of the excitement around Bun. And they said, for starters, the next release of Dino will include a new HTTP server. It's the fastest JS web server ever built. So I'm sure you two saw this announcement. A lot of people talking about Dino's big changes upcoming soon. Curious your hot takes, or maybe it's been a few days, maybe you have some warm down takes. What do you think about this? What's going on? I think it's really nice that Dino's having some type of interop with NPM because that's been a deterrent for me, like going full on in Dino so far. I wonder how this is going to be received, but it kind of reminds me of the author of Homebrew wanting to like recreate Homebrew, but um, using the blockchain. Have you heard of this? It's called T. And it's basically brew, but... Ah, yeah, Max Howell, the original creator of Homebrew. I did hear about this. I heard the initial announcement, and I didn't, haven't heard anything since, but I'm sure they're working on it. Yeah, but it just reminds me of that because it's this, like, big step of... It's a big change. I feel like this change to Dino is in, in a similar order. I'm excited to see how the community will grow and actually use it. I'm excited to use it myself. Okay, Ball, does this make Dino suddenly... I mean, assuming that they ship this uh, at some point in the next 90 days, does it make it much more of a feasible adoption story for you as a developer? Potentially, yeah. I mean, it's a sign that maybe they're starting to listen to the developer community and think about what's going to make this usable instead of a fun toy. Wow, controversial. Okay, very hot, very spicy take. There's some salt behind that, man. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, right? So when you want to run an early project and you want to explore some new things, it's actually better to treat it as a toy or treat it as something where you're not trying to meet everybody's needs, you're not trying to do all these things, because that's what lets you explore. But it also means that you have something that is not necessarily ready for production use in any way, right? Like importing from a URL that you don't own has always struck me as like, it's not standardized, it's not like, nobody's going to do that. 
in production. <laughs> uh, now you're going to have to set up your own package management system to make sure that you have consistent versions and other things. Like just all sorts of layers of this that just did not feel like they were aiming at trying to get this used by people who are not playing and hacking for fun, which right, fine. That may be the best way to approach it when you're trying to do something new and different. And I'm totally fine with that. But I did feel like there was maybe some attempts to sell it as something that was for people doing production projects before it was actually trying to listen to what those folks needed. Hmm. And this looks like, okay, maybe they're listening. So great. What's interesting is that like, that's the route that go went, you know, with like just import a URL and you know, 10 years later, I mean, it's longer than that, but like the go community has been dealing with that and the fallout of that. And like the, now there's go mod, like there's module system. Like they've been working around like, okay, but we do need actual package management ever since. Ever since, right? And that came because it was from Google, right? Like Google didn't care. Google, they're like, we own all our stuff. We're going to write all our own code anyway. We don't care. But Dino's coming from the outside. Right, that's what I'm saying. It seems like they would have learned, and even Go has had serious ramifications from that decision amongst the community. And it seems like, you know, Dino starting maybe eight years into Go's lifespan would have looked over and said, I like the purity of like, well, just, you know, just another universal resource locator. Like, just give us that and we can... Resolve and download is very, very webby, but it's actually lacking in many significant ways. What about the runtime speed stuff? I mean, even in their expansion, they say there's been a lot of chatter recently about runtime speed. I mean, are they pretty seem like they're uh, they're intimidated here by what Bun is up to? Yeah, Bun and the workers runtime. I don't know how Dino Deploy works, how well it works rather with serverless functions. That's another thing I want to try and play with because it's it's a beefier runtime. So I expect it to not be, I'd love to just see numbers about how that looks anyway. How fast it boots and stuff, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I think there are probably a subset of people for which that's important. I've found that anytime I'm running server-side code, the limiting factor is almost never the code itself and it's network access and database access. So like, I don't, I don't have any use cases where the speed of that thing is going to make that big of a difference. I think in the somewhat distant, maybe near future, like where everyone's building with these serverless platforms and the the edge processing, like that boot time, that speed of just like from the point that you invoke this remote function to the point that it's finished has become very important for the lambdas of the world, for the Vercells, for the Netlify function, the Cloudflare, et cetera. In your dev box, in your local machine, or in your like persistent, like long running server process, like who cares, right? Nodes plenty fast for that kind of stuff as long as you're not blocking or something. But So there's an interesting separation there between execution time and boot time. All right, we had a conversation, was it with Cloudflare or someone like that on one a previous episode? I can look it up. Where they were basically compiling the entire node runtime to WebAssembly because then they didn't have to boot the node process for the serverless thing. And so if they're, right. and I haven't dug deep into what Dino is promising or what Bun is doing, but if they're dramatically improving like, the boot time for running it as compared to the sort of execution time once the thread is booted, that could have a serious impact on serverless environments. All right. So that's Dino's big changes. Uh, A lot of talk. They still have to deliver. Hopefully they are. This is definitely a good direction, especially with the NPM stuff for them to get people using it actually out there in the real world. So love to see the competition too. Like, you know, the fact that Bun comes out, makes these benchmarks, blows everybody's mind. And it's like, now the Dino team's like, hey, we got to, we got to get faster. Like that, everybody wins. So that's super cool. All right, let's move on. K-Ball, what is your story of the week? Yeah. So I saw that Chrome in their next mainline release is going to have container queries. Woo! Yes. They've been shipping it behind, you know, a flag for a while, people testing it, doing different things. This is, in case folks are not familiar with container queries, this has been like a top requested CSS feature for yeah. as long as I've been in web development, which that's a long ass time. Like <laughs> I need to tell y'all, like the this is really exciting, especially for me, because the first conference I ever spoke at was JSConf EU in 2018, four years ago. And there was a talk about container queries at this conference where effectively the talk was, here's why they can't be done. So four years later, ah, they're shipping in Chrome. This is a huge deal. Uh, it's really awesome to see. 
So that's coming up in version 105. What's Chrome Mint now? Like, is this like right around the corner? Is this out there on the beta channel? What's the status? I just upgraded to 104, I think. So this is next. Yeah. Okay. So right around the corner, less than two weeks away, right? Or is it not two week? Pro- is it a two week cycle or a six week cycle? I can never remember. And neither can you. None of us work on the Chrome team. I don't know. Just hit your update function and see if it's there. 105. Yeah. I think it's six weeks. <laughs> Just reboot your Chrome. Six weeks sounds like it makes more sense. I'm curious to look into this article and see the, the syntax one would have to write in CSS to query a container. That sounds interesting. But it definitely unlocks a whole world of like new things you can do. Absolutely. Excited. All right. Real quick, real quick look. So that's Chrome. Can I use .com container queries? Under development. Safari 16 technology preview, it's supported. Chrome 105, partial support 106, it says it's like totally green. So Safari, which includes iOS and Chrome, are green. And Firefox is still bloody red. So not going to have 100% coverage anytime soon, but I wonder when, if and when Firefox is going to jump on this bandwagon. Hopefully soon, hopefully soon. All right, Tejas, what about yourself? What's your story of the week? My story of the week is something that I'm really excited about. It's from Yuri Strumpflona, who works on the Narwhal team. They make this awesome tool for mono repos. Yeah, we just had Yuri on the podcast a couple of weeks back. Yuri's the best, and so is NX and all the tools. Man, like, I, honestly, they could do, like, a master class in, like, developer experience, in my opinion. Like, their, their tool for mono repos is just... Ah, it's pristine. Anyway, he wrote a blog post today about how NX is helping the environment by saving two centuries of compute time. (laughs) So it's a fascinating read about caching. And I'm not going to like tell you about it because there's a link you can read it yourself. But what I will tell you, and I think what's more interesting for the podcast is why I chose to, to share this and why I think it's such a huge deal. And that's because the planet's dying and we make it worse with the work we do especially installing all those node modules, yo, you people. I'm joking. Use Dino, man. There's no node modules, you know. See, that should be their pitch. <laughs> save the planet. <laughs> <laughs> Use Dino, save the world. No, but this talks about the reduced carbon footprint of NX Cloud based on their reduced computation through caching. So like they, in the last seven days, have saved about 400 kilograms of carbon dioxide emissions. 400 kilograms, that's almost half a ton in a week. It's a fascinating read about how they're doing this. And and what I really like about this is it draws attention to responsible computing. You know, going back to human skills, I think being conscious of our environmental impact is another human skill that's quite important. And that's another pillar of impact, if you will, going back to the blog post, right? We do have mm-hmm. an environmental impact at this point that we ought to acknowledge. You know why? Because it's the peak of summer here in Germany, some 100 degrees Celsius uh, Fahrenheit. And it just like literally started like flooding and bucketing outside thunderstorms out of literally nowhere. And I'm not used to extreme weather like this, y'all. All of this kind of inspired me sharing this big story of the week. Yeah, we touched a little bit on this in our, our podcast with Yuri, which was, I think, just three or four weeks ago. But it looks like the article goes much deeper on, on what they're doing there, which is great. Yeah, I can recommend. Very cool stuff with big implications. Well, we're running short on time, but we want to get to shout outs because you've teased it a couple of times and we have to deliver this this book recommendation which you're in love with, Tejas. Uh, explain the book, why you love it, where people can find it. People sure. already bought it during the break, so this is a good sales pitch. Actually, there, he, didn't to, he just told Cable that it's great and Cable just bought it. So yeah, help everybody else be convinced. So I, first of all, need to say I have no vested interest in this book. I'm not going to get money or anything if you buy it. I'm not an affiliate or whatever, but I genuinely believe in it. Like it has helped every relationship I have. And all of the strained ones that I have had, I, some of, many of us have difficult relationships, have, have recovered gracefully. It's really, I've seen the results. This book is called Plays Well With Others by Eric Barker. And I love the concept even because how it works is the book explores maxims that we hear growing up. Maxims like, just be yourself. And maxims like, when in Rome, do as the Romans do, right? And then you ask yourself, okay, but which one? Both of these conflict. Do I be myself or do I do as the Romans do? And what he does is, Eric does is, he takes these sayings and examines them through the lens of science, citing research from leading research bodies. And the cool thing about this book is, I read it on my iPhone, so the screen size was a bit small, but on my device, the last... 200 pages were all footnotes and citations. 
Um, and you can go read the research for yourself. It's fascinating stuff. So the book looks at questions like, can you judge a book by its cover? Meaning, can you read people's intentions or not? Is no man an island? Do opposites actually attract? And it's got like amazing takeaways for interpersonal relationships, work relationships, marriages, like every relationship you can think of. So yeah, huge shout out for me. And I'm, I would recommend it to literally everyone. Very cool. Well, the links in the show notes, K-Ball, I know you have some shout outs written down. We have a, a minute or two. If you want to make it quick, we'll do a couple more shout outs before the show's over. Yeah, I just have one I was going to shout out, which is lead dev or lead dev.com. It's one of the few places I've seen that is actually publishing good technical and non-technical content for engineers who are way beyond just working on technical details. So this human skills concept that we've been talking about, architectural concepts, all sorts of different things. So they focus on both kind of staff plus engineers, so folks who are you know, really advanced in their careers, but still as individual contributors. And then they also have a bunch of stuff for engineering managers and, and leaders. And I have been loving their content. I've started trying to write for them. I love their, they've got panels, they've got conferences, they've got all sorts of stuff. And so, you know, I just love seeing more attention on those later stages of a career that often have been neglected and there's not much good material out there for it. Very cool. And I see you have been doing some of your own writing on the site as well. Isn't that right, Cable? Do you want to shout out any of your, what are some of your pieces you've written? So, well, I've published two pieces with them so far. They're both focused on kind of that sort of bridge between technology and human skills. So one is focused on the idea of quality ratchets. So how do you institute, you know, once you get to be working on problems that are too big to solve in one go, how do you start introducing ratchets into that so that you can improve the quality and then it doesn't backslide while you have to focus on something else? And so how do you introduce both technical ratchets, human ratchets, other types of things in place to kind of keep quality moving in the right direction? The other one is on a refactoring technique called creating application seams and this idea of you know, creating seams in your application that give you the ability to kind of chunk changes in a way that's not impactful to the rest of code. And this is an especially useful technique when you work with a lot of legacy code, where legacy code is anything six months and older is one of my favorite definitions, but or anything untested or anything where, where stuff has gotten a little out of hand and you... Things are kind of spaghettied together or you've got your data model tangled up with your usage or all sorts of different problems. How do you kind of tease that apart and create something that is actually easy to work with? So those are both fun. I'm pitching them some more articles. I, like I've, As I said, I love what they're doing here. And this is a domain that I think there's really interesting ideas to talk about. Like how do we make engineering as a discipline better beyond writing better code? Very cool. All right, we are getting to the end of the show. Tejas, thanks so much for joining us. Any final words from you before we call it a day? This has been great. I've enjoyed vibing with y'all thoroughly. You're nice people. I would do this again sometime. Let's do it. We appreciate it. We enjoyed having you on as well. If you like Tejas, you like what he's up to, maybe go see his talk at React Brussels. If you're in the area of Brussels, October 14th, Try to go IRL. If you're not, they are going to be hybrids, so they'll be online as well. Maybe check out his YouTube if you want to check out that talk he was referring to earlier where he deconstructs React. Of course, all the links to all the things are in your show notes. We've got the Pillars of Impact blog post. We've got all the news we discussed. We have a link to that book. And Lead Dev uh, Cable, hook me up with your pieces. We'll link to your pieces as well. And so you can follow up and follow the trail of the interesting stuff discussed here. Well, that's all for today. Oh, and don't forget, if you do want to go to React Brussels, save yourself 30%. Get that JS Party Time coupon code and follow JS Party FM on Twitter for details about the giving away of one IRL ticket and five online tickets. So don't miss out on that opportunity. Why not, right? Why not? That's what I say. So that's all for now. Uh, thanks for listening. I'm Jared. That's K-Ball. Tejas was our special guest today. And we'll talk to you all next time. That is JS Party for this week. Thanks for listening. Now is the time to subscribe. If you haven't yet, head to jsparty.fm for all the ways. If you've already subscribed and you've been listening for a while, maybe join our membership program. 
You can directly support our work, save yourself some time by ditching the ads, and get bonuses like exclusive content and free stickers. Check it out at changelog.com slash plus plus. Thanks again to our partners at Fastly for CDNing for us, to fly.io for hosting our app servers and database, to the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder for these dope beats, and to you for being part of the JS Party community. We appreciate you. That is all for now. We'll party with you again next week. Next week.